We're going to go over a couple examples of the pigeonhole principle. And I've written down, this is from directly from Rosen's Discrete Mathematics book. Um, his version of the pigeonhole principle, at least the generalized pigeonhole principle, is as follows. So you have if n objects are placed in the k boxes, that's the most important part, then there's at least one box containing at least the ceiling of n divided by k objects. And then this other stuff at the end of the fact here we'll use later on, but we don't always have to use that. So there are a couple ways you can solve pigeonhole principle problems. One method, which I call the worst case scenario method, relies on common sense um, more than anything else. And so I like to use that one when I can. Occasionally I'll, I'll use the formula uh, because it's easier in a f few examples. But so here's an example that's a pretty standard one. Show that if there are 30 students in a class, then there are at least two that have last names to begin with the same letter. So basically, I think about this as well, I'm going to line up the students, I'm going to question each student in the class. And let's say my goal is to prove this as quickly as possible. And the worst case scenario method that you use basically says that you're really unlucky when you choose people so that you don't get to uh, prove this quickly. In other words, you, you, you end up being as unlucky as you could possibly be if you're picking things at random. In this case, I'm talking to people at random, asking them what their last name begins with. And I'd like to get uh, quickly to two people that have the same uh, letter that begins their last name. But because I'm unlucky, we'll call this the worst case scenario. Uh, so worst case scenario method. Because I'm unlucky, I, I find, well, the first person I talk to, strangely, has last name that begins with A. The second one I talk to has B. It doesn't have to be in this order, but it makes it easier to think of it this way. The third person I talk to, darn it, has C. Um, and I keep going, and you guessed it, I get all the way to X, Y, and Z. And I still haven't found someone that repeats the first letter of the last name. So I have four more shots, right? But now's the point at which I have to, uh, I have to get somebody, right? Because I've already exhausted every letter in the alphabet, and you can't have um, a letter that's not in one of these 26 uh, for your last name, for the beginning of your last name, at least not in this problem. So let's say, without loss of generality, the last four people I talk to all have last names that begin with A. Well, sure enough, I've gone through 30 people. And, this, and I've had terrible luck because I could have talked to these people at the end here earlier, but because of my terrible luck, uh, the worst case scenario is this is what it would look like. And so sure enough, I have at least two people that have the last name of A. Now, there's nothing or that begins with A. There's nothing special about the letter A here. Without lost generality, you can talk about any order of the letters, and of course you can talk about these last four being any letter you want. And so what does that give me the answer, right? And that gives me the answer of at least two. Now this is a common sense question. Most students can answer this pretty quickly. Um, now if you wanted to use the formula, then I'm going to take the ceiling of n objects, in this case they're the students, uh, divided by k boxes and the boxes represent a different letter that begins the last name. And so, well, there were 30 students in the class, 26 possible letters that could begin a last name. And so 36 divided by 2, I mean, uh, thir sorry, 30 divided by 26 is 1 point something. Take the seal of 1 point something, you get back 2. That's another way to do that problem. So I prefer the first method, but a lot of students do the second method. Oh, here we go. I've got blue, blue, red cubes and blue cubes. I don't know if you have these lying around the house, but they're pretty cool. You have a bowl of them, apparently, and they contain, this bowl contains 10 red, red cubes and 10 blue cubes. A woman selects a cube at random, the, the cubes at random without looking at them. How many cubes must she select to be sure of having at least three cubes of the same color? Well, again, worst case scenario method what's going to happen here without 
loss of generality will just start with red, right? Um, so let's say that she starts and picks out a red one. Now, if she had good luck, she could pick out another red one and another red one, but she has the worst luck in the world. So if she has the worst luck in the world and she really wants to pick three at the same time, three, uh, three in a row, she she's doing what we call the worst case scenario. Um, so the worst case scenario, the longest we can stretch this out is red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, right? And what's the first time that she has gotten three if this is the worst case scenario? There's one red, there's one red. Oh, it was the fifth slot in the worst case scenario. So the fifth choice. And that implies that she must select five cubes before she's guaranteed to have at least three of the same color. Okay, probably she picked out three of the same colors be color before five cubes, but we can't know. This is the worst case scenario. We want to be sure of having at least three, and this is the minimum number she, the maximum number she'd have to pick out to get three. All right, of the same color. Now, how many cubes must be she select to be sure of having at least three blue cubes. Well, again, we're going to use the worst case scenario method here. We'll use blue because we can. And we'll think about this. Let's say she wants to get at least three blue cubes. Worst case scenario, she has terrible luck. So what could happen? Well, she could pick, you guessed it, all ten red cubes first. So she could to pick all 10 red cubes that are in there if she had terrible luck. And then finally pick three blue cubes. Well, this is at the corner of my, my, <laughs> my screen. So that's a B. All right, let's see if we can move this over. Come on now, you can do this. Come on now, you can. Oh, yes. Nice. Technology. Okay, so what happens is she was really unlucky, and then that was a bad left click. Okay, then she gets a blue, blue, and blue as her last three. And this is the worst case scenario. This person has terrible luck. Maybe you feel like you're like this. Um, and so that means that to be sure of having at least three blue cubes she has to pick at random 13 cubes. Again, more than likely, of course, she's going to pick three blue cubes a lot sooner than that, but we're not worried about probabilities right now yet. All right, let's go over a few more. How many numbers must be selected from the set, this set, to guarantee that at least one pair of these numbers adds up to 16. All right. Well, if you notice, it's a clever question in the sense that here are the ways you can add up to 16. So I'm going to take this set and split up into a number of subsets. Here are all the ways from those numbers you can get 16. All right. So um, now we'll we'll pretend without loss of generality that um, we're really unlucky, okay? So, and I've only grouped it these way, this way, so you can see these are the order, these are the pairs that give us 16 if you sum them up, okay? So, well, if you're really unlucky, you're just going to take each time you're going to take one out of these, one out of this, one out of this, one out of this, one out of this, and each time it's going to be the one that doesn't satisfy the other one till you get all the way around. So, in other words, uh, so 15. Without loss of generality, I'm going to do that one. And then I pick out a 13. Well, I haven't added up yet, right? Anything that can... These two numbers don't add up to give me 16. And nor will 11 and 9, all right? So now, when I keep going, 
I'm going to have to get some number that adds up that adds up with one of these other numbers that to get 16. Okay, so the sum of that number and one of these numbers I've already picked is going to give me 16. So even if if I pick one, right, that'll add with five. I mean, 15 to give me 16. The sum of three and 13. So I've already exhausted all the choices that were the worst case scenario, right? So that means that I have to pick five uh, in order to guarantee at least one pair of these numbers adds up to 16. Now, if you'd gone the other way, of course, and said, well, I'm going to pick one, three, five, I'm not using commas this time, right? Five, seven, And that, you know, it's the same idea because now I'm either going to pick 15, 13, 11, or 9, which again gives me the answer five choices I have to make. Okay. Let me make that five a little nicer. All right, last one. This, in many ways, is the most interesting one. Wait till you see it. All right. Uh, suppose there are nine students in a discrete math class at a small college. Show that the class must have at least five male students or at least five female students. This is a great example of how you can use proof by contradiction to uh, to show that the class must have at least five male students or at least five female students. Okay, so suppose to the contrary, let's do it in green. Suppose to the contrary that you don't have at least five males and at least or at least five females so the the negation of that is you have you have four or fewer males And you have four or fewer females. Oh, wow. Okay. And the reason for that, we'll put it over here in red, is so um, at least five male students means that I'm greater than or equal to five, right? And at least fema five female students means I'm greater than or equal to five. Well, how do you negate that? Well, the negation of this guy is strictly less than five or four or fewer. So that's how I get that. And the same thing holds for this guy right here. So I'm just negating what has been given mathematically. All right. So we don't need that anymore. And we can finish our proof. So this should lead to a contradiction, or I've done it wrong. It sure does. But then, oh, I, I want green. What am I doing? I had that red still. Green. So, but then, four males... And four females would mean so that's at the most right uh, because it says four or fewer but let's say at the most I have four males and four females that would mean there are eight people in the class They're students, but they're still people, we hope. And that's our contradiction. Because what what do we know from what was given? There were nine students. In the class. Okay, so that that is your proof by contradiction. And we can go ahead and put 
little box here and we can call that a proof. All right. There you have it.